Meet Charles Francis Xavier, Professor X to most, a mutant with a mind so powerful it's like Wi-Fi for thoughts. He's the founder and leader of the X-Men, and also the mastermind behind the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters, where gifted is just a polite way of saying superpowered. You know, the kind of school where showing up late might mean teleporting across town or accidentally phasing through walls. Professor X isn't just any telepath. He's one of the most powerful in the world. His only serious competition, Jean Grey. And honestly, when someone can turn into a cosmic firebird, you just have to let them have that one. But Charles is no slouch. He's spent a lifetime using his powers to push for a peaceful coexistence between mutants and humans. That's been his dream, his mission, and the whole reason the X-Men exist in the first place. Back in 1962, while the rest of the world was figuring out rock and roll and space travel, Professor X was busy gathering a team of mutants to protect both humans and mutants from the dangers out there, and sometimes the dangers from within. With his telepathic powers and scientific genius, he's not just the brain behind the X-Men, he's the heart, always guiding his students and fellow mutants toward a better future. Welcome, true believers, to Stan Lee Presents, your go-to for epic comic character history. Want more stories of your favorite heroes and villains? Like, subscribe, and join us for weekly lessons on the legends of Marvel. X-Men First Class. Picture this, it's 1944 and young Charles, just 12 years old and already living the mansion life, bumps into a shape-shifting surprise named Raven. Now, instead of freaking out like most kids would if they caught someone rummaging through their snack stash, Charles does the unexpected. He's thrilled to meet someone else who's different, because let's face it, normal is overrated, and in true buddy movie fashion invites her to stick around. And so, Charles and Raven become best buds, thicker than thieves, and probably just as mischievous but with more heart. Fast forward a few years and Charles, the natural genius he is, seriously, kids got brains on brains, heads off to Oxford University. Raven, now his foster sister and probably still winning at hide and seek, tags along. By age 30, Charles has not only gotten his PhD in genetics, because why not, but also has written a thesis on genetic mutation that probably had every professor reaching for a dictionary. Just as he's about to bask in the glow of his academic glory, the CIA shows up with an offer he can't refuse. Because, of course, they need his help to stop a mutant named Sebastian Shaw, who's decided teaming up with the Soviet Union is a great way to spend his weekends. So Charles, Raven, and Moira McTaggart, the CIA agent who looks like she could be a character in her own right, head to the agency, where they meet John McCone. Unfortunately, John's not too thrilled with the whole mutants are real and one of them is about to cause a major international crisis spiel. But not to worry, enter the man in black. Because what's a CIA story without a mysterious guy in sunglasses backing you up? With him on board, things get rolling. Charles joins McTaggart and the MIB on a mission to capture Shaw aboard his fancy yacht, because of course the villain has a yacht. Things get dicey when telepathic blocking, courtesy of Emma Frost, throws a wrench in their plan. As if that's not enough, they bump into Eric Lenscher, aka the guy who's been running his own personal revenge tour against Shaw. Things get a little chaotic, which could be an understatement, and when Shaw escapes in a submarine, because who doesn't have one of those, Charles pulls Eric out of a self-destructive spiral. They make it back to the CIA's top secret Division X facility where the plot thickens. There they meet Hank McCoy, a genius scientist who just so happens to have prehensile feet, a sentence no one ever expects to say. Charles, being the telepathic powerhouse that he is, immediately clocks Hank as a mutant. Together they fire up Cerebro, Hank's mutant finding device, think Google Maps for superpowers, and start recruiting mutants to take down Shaw. They round up a colorful cast of characters, Angel Salvadore, the exotic dancer with wings, Armando Munoz, the adaptable taxi driver, Alex Summers, who's an army prisoner with an explosive temper, literally, and Sean Cassidy, a guy with sonic scream powers that could shatter glass or make you wish he had earplugs. At one point, they even try to recruit a certain Canadian mercenary named Wolverine, still going by Jimmy at this point, but let's just say that didn't go over so well. One growl from him and Charles and Eric wisely decided to back off. Meanwhile, the team closes in on Shaw, but surprise! Instead of Shaw, they find Emma Frost schmoozing with a high-ranking Soviet general. Frost gets captured and spills the beans about Shaw's big plan, to kickstart World War III and pave the way for a mutant-dominated future. You know, typical villain stuff. Meanwhile, Shaw's loyal Hellfire Club gang crashes Division X, turning Angel to their side and tragically offing Darwin in the process. 
Things are heating up and it's clear that Shaw is not playing around. Time to save the world, no pressure or anything. With their facility turned into mutant confetti, Xavier does the only logical thing. He invites the whole gang to crash at his family mansion. Not exactly your typical house guests, but hey, it beats the local motel. While they're there, Xavier puts his telepathy to good use, helping Eric level up his magnetic mojo like he's prepping for a mutant talent show. He also gets the rest of the crew to tighten up their power control. After all, nobody wants a mutant accident before breakfast. The calm before the storm doesn't last too long. Shaw, ever the drama queen, orchestrates a tense standoff between the United States and Soviet naval forces because, you know, world domination plots and Cold War tension go together like PB and J. When the Hellfire Club hijacks a Soviet freighter and decides to crash the party by running the American blockade, Xavier's spidey, I mean telepathic senses kick in. He dives into the minds of the Soviet fleet, trying to find Shaw, but to no luck. Shaw's sporting a stylish helmet that blocks telepathy, like tinfoil, but way cooler. So in a moment of quick thinking and probably a little panic, Xavier mentally puppeteers a Soviet officer into blowing up the freighter, sidestepping a nuclear explosion big enough to turn the Cold War hot. Crisis averted for now. It's not over yet though. Enter Banshee, the team's resident scream machine who volunteers to use his sound powers as sonar. It's like whale communication, but louder. Xavier guides the Blackbird, because every superhero team needs a jet with a cool name, straight to Shaw's submarine. Eric, channeling his inner magnetic superhero, yanks the sub right out of the water. But because nothing goes smoothly in these kinds of adventures, both the sub and the Blackbird crash, leading to a mutant showdown that even the local news would struggle to report. While chaos ensues, Xavier stays behind with the jet, telepathically linked to Eric, who's on a solo mission to confront Shaw. And let's just say when Eric finds him, it's not gonna end with a friendly chat over coffee. Spoiler, Eric gets his revenge and Shaw gets, well, dead. But now there's a new problem. Both the US and Soviet fleets are spooked, and they start firing every missile and artillery piece they've got at the mutants. Talk about overreaction. Eric, not one to let a missile ruin his day, sends those missiles right back at him, giving new meaning to the phrase, return to sender. This leads to a clash between Xavier and Eric, friends on opposite sides of a very explosive disagreement. Xavier tries to stop Eric from blowing the ship's sky high, but just as things are reaching a tipping point, McTaggart tries to play hero and fires a gun at Eric. Eric. Big mistake. Eric deflects the bullet, naturally, but it ricochets right into Xavier's spine. The result? Xavier's legs are out of commission. Permanently. Ouch. A guilt-ridden Eric, realizing he's gone too far, leaves with Raven, Angel, and the rest of Shaw's ex-crew, including Riptide and Azazel, like a supervillain family on the run. Later, Xavier, now in a wheelchair but still full of determination, returns to his mansion. McTaggart, probably feeling a little bad about the, you know, whole getting shot thing, promises to never reveal his location. They share a kiss, but Xavier, ever the gentleman and ever the telepath, wipes her memory of the whole ordeal. Smooth move, Professor X. With a heavy heart and a new mission in mind, Xavier sets his sights on the future. His plan? To open a school for mutants at the Westchester Mansion, a place to train the next generation of heroes. And thus, the X-Men are born. Roll credits. Between X-Men First Class and X-Men Days of Future Past, in 1965, Professor Xavier finally opened the doors of the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters, a dream realized. It was supposed to be a safe haven for young mutants, a place to learn, grow, and, well, hopefully not blow anything up while doing it. But just as the school was getting off the ground, the world decided it had other plans. The Vietnam War kicked into high gear, and like a bad plot twist, students and staff started getting drafted left and right. Before long, the school couldn't keep the lights on, let alone teach Intro to Telekinesis 101. By the early 1970s, Xavier had to shut the place down and turn his mansion back into a private residence. It didn't take long before the estate looked like something out of a haunted house movie, neglected, run down, and probably a bit spooky at night. As the years ticked by, from the late 1960s to early 1970s, Xavier became something of a recluse. Picture him in his big empty mansion, probably binge reading books or staring out windows in dramatic fashion. The only one who stuck around was McCoy, his ever loyal friend who did his best to help Xavier maintain what was left of the estate. But things weren't looking too bright for the old professor. Between Eric Lenscher, better known as Magneto, allegedly being involved in the Kennedy assassination and Raven walking out on him after years of being his closest friend and foster sister, Xavier had enough emotional baggage to fill a jumbo jet. Bitterness set in, and honestly, who could blame him? 
Then came McCoy with a game-changing serum. It was like something straight out of a superhero lab. It regulated his own mutation and, more impressively, allowed Xavier to walk again. Suddenly, the professor was back on his feet, which was a major upgrade. The catch? There's always a catch. The serum, while making him mobile, took a serious toll on his telepathic powers. It was like trading your super brain for a pair of working legs. So there he was, walking again, but no longer the telepathic powerhouse he once was. Life's all about balance, right? Except in Xavier's case, it seemed like the scales were perpetually tipping in all the wrong directions. Prior to X-Men Origins Wolverine In 1979, Professor Xavier decided to take matters into his own hands and personally rounded up a fresh group of mutants, like a superhero road trip but with fewer snacks and more telepathy. This ragtag bunch included Scott Summers, Elizabeth Braddock, Emma Silverfox, and a few other escapees from the infamous Weapon X facility on Three Mile Island. Who busted them out, you ask? None other than Logan, the very same guy Charles and Eric once tried to recruit for Division X. Guess he finally decided to play the hero after all. Using his telepathic GPS, because let's face it, Xavier never needs a map, he guided Summers and the others out of the facility, leading them straight to the exit where he was waiting, cool as ever, standing by a helicopter. Because when you're Professor X, you don't just show up in a regular car. He then flew them back to school like it was the most casual mutant rescue mission ever. Jump ahead to 1986 and Charles and Eric are out on another important recruitment mission, this time to the quiet suburban home of Jean Grey. Now, this isn't just any mutant visit. Jean is a class 5, which is Xavier speak for very powerful, as in bend reality, rearrange your mind, and maybe levitate your furniture kind of powerful. As they pull up to her house in a peaceful neighborhood, Eric, always the impatient one, grumbles about meeting mutants in person. Xavier, knowing just how special Jean is, gives a calm, nope, not this time, Jean's different. Inside the Gray family's living room, Mr. and Mrs. Gray are eyeing the brochure for Xavier's school, probably thinking it's a fancy boarding school while Eric sits there stewing. When Mrs. Gray calls Jean's powers an illness, Eric nearly flips the coffee table. He fires back, asking if they really think their daughter's sick. Xavier, knowing full well Eric's temper could turn this meet and greet into a disaster, steps in and coolly suggests they chat with Jean alone. Mrs. Gray, eager to avoid any mutant-sized tension, agrees and calls for Jean. Enter Jean Gray, a young redhead with more power than she knows what to do with. She takes a seat, but it doesn't take long before Xavier notices she's already poking around in their minds, no invitation necessary. Xavier, always the polite one, casually reminds Jean that reading thoughts without permission is a bit rude, even for a mutant. Eric, meanwhile, cuts to the chase, asking if Jean thought she was the only one like her. Charles jumps in to explain that they're all mutants, but Jean, being the sassy powerhouse she is, isn't convinced. Cue the impromptu mutant demonstration. Outside, a lawnmower goes flying out of some poor guy's hands, and another guy watches in shock as water from his hose decides to defy gravity. Eric, clearly impressed by the chaos, turns to Charles with a grin and says, I like this one. Xavier, ever the mentor, calmly tells Jean that she's got more power than she can imagine, a statement that probably had Eric nodding in agreement. Just as if to punctuate the point, all of the cars floating midair drop back to the ground outside like nothing happened. Because in Jean Grey's world, what goes up might just stay up. Prior to X-Men Sometime after 1986, Charles and Eric, no surprise here, had yet another epic falling out. Apparently, being on the same team just wasn't in the cards for these two. Eric packed his bags, did the whole dramatic exit, and went off to reform the Brotherhood of Mutants, because naming your group after something ominous is always a good start. Meanwhile, Charles, ever the optimist, stuck around to keep running the school. It's hard to say which is tougher, dealing with teenagers learning to control their mutant powers or keeping Eric from trying to start World War III every other Tuesday. Now, cut to the Capitol, where Dr. Jean Grey is about to take center stage in front of the Senate, talking about the latest hot topic, the mutant registration law. And who's sitting there front and center, watching on proudly? None other than Professor Charles Xavier, playing the supportive mentor role like a pro. Jean's explaining how mutant powers get triggered, probably hoping she doesn't accidentally trigger any powers while explaining. But before she can get too far into her speech, Senator Robert Kelly cuts in, playing the role of the classic, slightly paranoid politician. Educational, sure, Kelly says, but let's talk about the real issue here. Are mutants dangerous? Jean, probably resisting the urge to roll her eyes, fires back that it's an unfair question. I mean, put the wrong person behind the wheel of a car and they're dangerous, right? Kelly's not one to back down, though, and quips that this is why people get licenses to drive. Jean, cool as a cucumber, shoots back, yes, but not to live, making a point that hits like one of Wolverine's punches. She argues that mutants already face enough hostility, and forcing them to out themselves would only make things worse. 
Kelly, doing his best to keep the pressure on, interrupts once again. He demands to know what the mutants have to hide, and why they're so afraid to identify themselves. Then, like he's reading from a comic book villain script, he pulls out a list of identified mutants living in the US and starts throwing around wild hypotheticals. There's a girl in Illinois who can walk through walls, he says, probably making everyone in the room double check their locks. What's to stop her from walking into a bank safe or even the White House? He is laying it on thick, and just when you think he's done, he goes full conspiracy theorist and brings up the mutants who can control minds. What about the ones who can take away our free will, he says, implying that some mutants are out there trying to rewrite the Constitution with their thoughts. By now, Xavier and and Jean are cringing at every word. To their disappointment, the room bursts into applause, because apparently scaring the public works like a charm. Kelly keeps on pushing for the Mutant Registration Act, making his case like a seasoned showman, but Xavier's attention suddenly shifts as he notices a familiar face slipping out of the crowd. He knows this mysterious man all too well, and in true superhero style, wheels out of the Senate chamber to follow him. The man is Eric Lencher, aka Magneto. Xavier asks his old ally what he's doing there. The two trade snipes, both attempting to figure out what the other is up to. Xavier desperately wants to see hope in Eric's mind, and Eric claims that mutants are the future, humans be damned. Eric departs, leaving Xavier disappointed. Afterwards, Xavier sends Storm and Cyclops to rescue Wolverine and Rogue from Sabretooth. When Wolverine arrives at the mansion, Xavier taps into his mind and telepathically guides him into a lecture he's giving. Logan has his first look at some of the mutant students here, and Xavier introduces himself. He tells Logan all about where he is and how he got there. Logan is mostly concerned about Rogue, and Xavier insists that she is safe and sound. That's when the mutant squad who rescued Logan arrives. They're introduced to Logan, Aurora Monroe, and Scott Summers, aka Storm and Cyclops. Logan is standoffish until Jean shows up. Xavier further explains the purpose of the school and how he and Rogue are now safe from Magneto. Indignant as always, Logan attempts to leave, but Xavier telepathically tells him that he can help him remember who he is. Xavier decides to lay it all out for Logan, explaining a bit more about the school. He convinces him that this place is the best shot Rogue's got. After all, it's not every day that you find a school that teaches algebra and how to control your mutant powers without accidentally blowing up a classroom. Then, with a knowing look, Xavier drops the big reveal. The school? Well, it's just a cover. The real action happens downstairs, and by real action, we're talking secret hangars and supersonic jets. He takes Logan on a tour of the lower levels, showing off the X-Men's pride and joy, the Blackbird. Xavier shares a bit of his backstory too. Turns out when he was a kid, he discovered he could control other people's minds, which, let's face it, would make him the ultimate hide-and-seek champion. At 17, he met Eric Lencher, who could control magnetism like some kind of human magnet. But while Xavier stayed optimistic about humanity, Eric went the opposite route, and decided to declare himself an enemy of mankind. You know, no, classic friendship drama. Xavier offers Logan a deal. 48 hours to figure out why Magneto's so obsessed with him, and in return, Xavier will help dig into that big ol' mystery that is Logan's past. Fair trade, right? Later, Jean Grey fills the Professor, Cyclops, and Storm in on her findings about Wolverine. Apparently, his entire skeleton is covered in an indestructible metal called adamantium, which, let's be honest, sounds both awesome and terrible at the same time. Aurora, always practical, asks how anyone could survive a procedure like that without, well, dying. Jean explains that Logan's mutation includes a supercharged healing factor, which basically makes him the ultimate comeback king. As a result, his age is a total mystery. For all they know, Logan could be older than the professor himself. Q Xavier silently wondering if Logan's been hiding anti-aging tips. Xavier asks the big question, who did this to Logan? Jean tells him Logan doesn't remember a thing. It's all a big blank, like someone hit the delete button on his memories. Xavier, putting two and two together, muses that it sounds like some sort of shady mutant experimentation. Cyclops, still trying to piece the puzzle together, asks what Magneto could possibly want with Logan. Xavier, not entirely sure, admits that maybe Magneto isn't after Logan at all. Maybe it's something bigger. Later that night, disaster strikes. In a moment of panic, Logan accidentally stabs Rogue. Yikes. Triggering her mutant power, which lets her absorb the abilities of anyone she touches. Logan's healing factor kicks in for her, but it sends him into a full-on unconscious state. When he finally wakes up, Xavier's there, keeping him company like the world's calmest nurse. Logan's first question is, is Rogue okay? Xavier assures him that she'll be fine. Confused, Logan asks what the heck just happened, and Xavier explains the deal. Whenever Rogue touches someone, she absorbs their energy, and in the case of mutants, their powers. She got Logan's healing ability, which saved her life, but it also nearly put him six feet under. 
Logan, still a bit rattled, says it felt like she almost killed him. Xavier, not sugarcoating it, agrees. If she had held on any longer, she could have. Logan, probably thinking he's gonna have to start sleeping with gloves on, starts to process just how dangerous and powerful Rogue really is. Down in the underground part of the mansion, where all the really cool stuff is kept, Xavier and Cyclops are busy trying to figure out just what Magneto wants with Wolverine. Xavier picks up on the fact that Scott isn't exactly in the running for Logan's biggest fan club. Just as the tension is building, Logan and Aurora, aka Storm, walk in with Logan doing what he does best, demanding answers. Where's Rogue, he asks, probably already planning to punch his way to a solution. Xavier, after a quick mind scan, because telepathy is just that handy, delivers the bad news. Rogue is gone. A few minutes later, the gang, Xavier, Scott, Jean, Aurora, and Logan, enter a secure room that looks like it's straight out of a sci-fi movie. Xavier welcomes Logan to Cerebro, the X-Men's giant mind-amplifying machine. It's a big round room with a dramatic bridge leading to the machine. You almost expect some ominous music to play when Xavier walks in. He explains that Cerebro amplifies his telepathic powers, allowing him to track mutants across huge distances, like a mutant-powered GPS. His plan? To use it to find Rogue. Logan, ever the straightforward guy, asks why not just use it to find Magneto? Good question. Xavier reveals that Magneto has figured out a way to shield himself from Cerebro's powers. And how would Magneto know how to do that? Well, it turns out that Xavier helped them build it in the first place. Awkward. Xavier slips on the Cerebro helmet, ready to start his mutant tracking session while the others exit the room. Outside, Logan asks Jean if she's ever used Cerebro. Jean, looking a little hesitant, admits she hasn't. Using Cerebro requires serious control, and for someone like her, it's a bit too dangerous. You know, with their whole potential to unleash world-ending powers thing. Meanwhile, inside the room, Xavier locates Rogue after a short search. She's at the train station. Classic Rogue, always on the move. Logan's ready to bolt out the door, but Xavier stops him with a telepathic, hold your horses. If Logan leaves, Magneto will snatch him up faster than a claw swipe. Instead, Xavier sends Cyclops and Storm on the mission to rescue Rogue. Seems like Logan's gonna have to sit this one out, for now. Over at the train station, Magneto, Sabretooth, and Toad have already managed to capture Rogue. As it turns out, Magneto can cannot resist a dramatic kidnapping. A police officer, clearly having no idea who he's dealing with, orders Magneto to stay put and raise his hands. Magneto, with a smirk, obliges, but with his hands, he also raises the police cars. They hover in the air, and then, in true Magneto fashion, he casually drops them on top of two other cars, like he's playing mutant Tetris. Naturally, the officers aim their guns at him, but Magneto's got that covered too, literally. With a flick of his power, the guns go flying out of their hands and point right back at the officers. Not looking too good for the police here. Just then, Sabretooth grabs Magneto's neck and growls, that's enough, Eric, while Toad, ever loyal, chimes in with, let them go. Magneto's not fooled for a second, though. He's got Xavier's telepathic meddling figured out. Why don't you come out where I can see you, Charles, Magneto shouts, knowing his old friend is lurking nearby. Sure enough, Xavier is sitting in a car with Jean, doing his best not to sigh at Magneto's theatrics. Xavier, ever calm and collected, telepathically asks Magneto what he needs Rogue for. Magneto, always ready with a quip, shoots back, can't you read my mind? He then launches into his classic villain speech, trying to convince Xavier that he's the one in the right. If they pass that law, he warns, they'll have all mutants chained up with numbers burned into their foreheads. Xavier, ever the optimist, insists that it won't come to that. Magneto isn't having it though. He throws down the gauntlet, telling Xavier just to kill him and find out for himself. Subtlety has never really been Magneto's style. When Xavier doesn't respond, Magneto takes things up a notch. He tells Xavier that if he's not going to answer, he should just release him. Still, no response. So what does Magneto do? He casually points a gun at the nearby officer using his powers and fires. The crowd gasps like they're watching the season finale of a soap opera, but when they open their eyes, they find the bullet frozen in midair, just an inch away from the officer's shocked face. Talk about cutting it close. Not done with his dramatic display, Magneto then aims all the guns at the officers, making it very clear to Xavier that he can't stop them all. The tension builds, and with a heavy sigh, because it's always a sigh with Charles, Xavier looks at Jean and releases his telepathic grip on Sabretooth and Toad. Magneto, of course, takes this as his cue for another lecture. 
He tells Xavier that his weakness is his unwillingness to make sacrifices, something Magneto has become an expert in. Right on time, Mystique swoops in with a helicopter and Magneto, Sabretooth, Toad, and a captured rogue all board. As they take off, all the guns and the floating bullet drop to the ground like the show's over. And for now, it is. Back at the mansion, Logan is getting mad. He's scrubbing his face, frustrated with Xavier for saying that Magneto wanted him. Xavier, probably feeling a little sheepish, apologizes, admitting he made a big mistake. Logan, not in the mood for apologies, storms off, ready to find Rogue by himself. But just as he's about to make a dramatic exit, Storm steps in, trying to convince him to stay and fight with the team. Logan opens the door, ready to ignore her, and surprise, on the other side stands Senator Kelly, looking about as lost as a guy can get, asking for Dr. Jean Grey. Well, that's one way to stop Logan in his tracks. Later, underground at the mansion, Kelly is lying on a table, looking more than a little out of his element. Logan and Jean are there too, and soon Xavier arrives, introducing himself like this is some kind of mutant therapy session. Kelly, clearly shaken, explains that he was too afraid to go to a regular hospital. Xavier, ever the mind reader, finishes his sentence, saying Kelly was worried they'd treat him like a mutant. Turns out, this is exactly what Kelly was afraid of. Xavier, doing his best to be the voice of reason, assures him that mutants aren't all what he thinks. But Kelly's not having it, snapping back with, tell that to the ones who did this to me. Xavier, always calm under pressure, asks Kelly to relax. Easier said than done when you're lying on a table in a mutant's underground bunker. Then Xavier begins to read Kelly's mind, diving into his memories. He relives the moment Magneto turned Kelly into a mutant, with Mystique by his side, helping Kelly out of that terrifying machine. And there's Magneto, looking drained and exhausted from the whole process, because turning a senator into a mutant is no easy feat, even for him. Xavier explains to the mutant squad what happened. Jean elaborates that the mutation in Kelly's body is unnatural and as such is being rejected. Xavier continues by saying that the radiation is harmless to mutants but could be super dangerous to humans. Logan wants to know what Magneto wants from Rogue and the group soon realizes that the villain wants the young mutant to take his powers and use the mutant making machine in his stead, killing her while allowing him to live. It's announced that Senator Kelly is dead and Xavier hops back in Cerebro to find Rogue before it's too late. However, Mystique's secret green goop knocks him out cold. Jean takes a look at Cerebro and tries to fix it, and Scott gives an impassioned speech to the unconscious professor. While Xavier takes his unintentional nap, the X-Men, plus Wolverine, go out to rescue Rogue and stop Magneto. They succeed, and the professor recovers. He tells Logan that he should check out an abandoned military compound in the Rockies. Later, he catches up with Magneto, now restrained in a totally plastic jail cell. Talk about modern. They play chess while discussing the future of the mutant registration law, and of course, hope. Sure, they're on talking terms for now, but Magneto makes it very clear that he is still on the warpath. Xavier says that he'll always be ready to stop him. X2, X-Men United. In the middle of a New York museum, the students from Xavier's school are on what should have been a regular peaceful field trip. But of course, when you're dealing with mutants, things rarely go as planned. Pyro, Rogue, and Iceman somehow manage to get into a scuffle with a couple of young men because hey, what's a field trip without a little drama? Suddenly though, everything, and I mean everything, stops. People freeze mid-action like someone hit a pause button on reality. Rogue, assuming this is just another mutant shenanigan, asks Bobby, aka Iceman, what happened? But even he's confused. I didn't do this. Cue the entrance of Professor Xavier, wheeling in like the coolest headmaster ever. He gives John, or Pyro, a pointed look and says, the next time you feel like showing off, don't. Because nothing says calm down like a little telepathic freeze frame. As if things weren't tense enough, a news report flashes across the TV, covering the mutant attack on the White House. Cyclops, ever the serious leader, takes one look and says, I think it's time to leave. Xavier, nodding in agreement, unfreezes the room, and just like that, the students and X-Men disappear before anyone can say mutant trouble. Back at Xavier's Institute, the X-Men are gathered in the professor's study, discussing the White House attack like it's the world's most stressful group project. Cyclops, always suspicious, thinks Magneto's pulling the strings, but Jean and Xavier aren't convinced. They point out that Magneto is in prison, and pulling off something like this would only hurt his grand villainous plans. Not to mention, organizing an attack from behind bars sounds more like something out of a bad action movie than Magneto's usual style. Storm, always practical, chimes in with her own concern. The government's probably going to use this as an excuse to bring back the dreaded Mutant Registration Act. Xavier, however, thinks it could be even worse. They might declare a state of emergency and round up every mutant in the country. Talk about a nightmare scenario. Gene brings up the big Q. 
Who's the attacker? Xavier knows they need to find him before the authorities do. He's been trying to track this rogue mutant using Cerebro, but the guy's movements are all over the place, like trying to catch lightning in a bottle. When Xavier finally pinpoints the exact location, he tells Jean and Aurora to suit up and go pick him up. Later in Cerebro, Xavier is prepping for another mutant search session. It's all high-tech, high-stakes stuff. Then in walks Wolverine, cigar in mouth. Xavier welcomes him back, but not before giving him the classic put out that cigar line. Logan, being Logan, looks around for somewhere to put it out, and when he comes up empty, decides to just put it out on his palm, because why not? Luckily, with that healing factor of his, his wound closes up faster than you can say ouchie. Logan asks Xavier if he wants him to leave, but Xavier tells him to stand still. This is about to get serious. The room goes dark, and then, like the stars in a mutant-powered galaxy, millions of dotted lights appear. Xavier explains that each light represents a living person on Earth. The white ones are humans, and the red ones are mutants. Through Cerebro, he's connected to them all, and them to him. Logan, never one to stay on topic, changes the subject and tells Xavier that he found a base at Alkali Lake. But here's the kicker, it's empty. Looks like Logan's still searching for answers, and maybe, just maybe, some peace of mind. Xavier seems to brush off Logan's presence as he focuses on the task at hand. He points out a broken line in Cerebro. It's the mutant who attacked the president, and Xavier's been having a tough time getting a solid lock on him. Logan suggests he just concentrate harder, because, you know, when in doubt, just focus more, right? But Xavier, with a bit more wisdom, replies that sure, he could do that, but it would probably kill the mutant they're trying to find. Logan, realizing this is a bit more delicate than claw fight, stays quiet. Suddenly, the mutant they're tracking stops running. His voice, praying in German, echoes through Cerebro. It's a strange moment, one that leaves Xavier stepping out of the machine. Logan asks Xavier to take another dive into his mind, hoping that this time will be the breakthrough. But Xavier reminds Logan that the mind isn't like a box you can just unlock and rummage through. He has no doubt that Logan's amnesia, adamantium skeleton, and those famous claws are all connected. But some things have to be discovered in their own time. Before he heads out, Xavier leaves Logan with a little responsibility. Watch the kids tonight. Logan might have a healing factor, but even he wasn't ready for babysitting duty. Xavier and Scott have an old friend to visit. Cut to the prison. Xavier and Cyclops arrive to pay a visit to none other than Magneto, their old frenemy. Scott, having to wait outside, watches as a guard wheels Xavier into the room on his plastic wheelchair, because anything metal is just asking for trouble. Magneto, always charming, welcomes Xavier with a sly, come to rescue me. But Xavier, all business today, simply replies, sorry Eric, not today. Magneto, curious now, asks why Xavier's there. And Xavier, ever direct, wants to know what Magneto knows about the assassination attempt on the president. Magneto plays coy, claiming he knows nothing. Xavier presses on, sensing something's off. He asks Magneto what happened to him. Magneto, dropping a major bombshell, reveals he's been having frequent visits from a certain William Stryker. This raises Xavier's eyebrows because he knows Stryker well. In fact, Stryker's son, Jason, was once a student at Xavier's school. Sadly, Xavier couldn't help him. Not in the way Stryker wanted, anyway. Magneto, switching gears, brings up Wolverine. It's clear that both he and Xavier know something about Logan's mysterious past, and it all ties back to Stryker. But Xavier insists Logan needs to figure things out for himself. The tension builds, and Xavier starts to sense that things are even worse than they seem. He asks Magneto what he's done. Magneto, not exactly the picture of remorse, apologizes and says he couldn't help it. Uh-oh. Xavier, alarmed now, demands to know what Magneto told Stryker. Magneto's response? Everything. At that moment, a soft hissing sound fills the room. Through the tiny plastic holes, gas begins slipping in. Magneto delivers his next ominous line. The war has begun. Xavier, now horrified, realizes what's happening. He grabs the plastic doors and screams for Scott, desperately trying to warn him, but it's too late. As the gas fills the room, both Xavier and Magneto lose consciousness. Magneto, in his last moment of clarity, tells Xavier what could have been. You should have killed me while you had the chance. In the cold, isolated wilderness of Alkali Lake, Canada, we find Professor Xavier tied to a chair, with the world's weirdest looking helmet strapped to his head. Not the best look for the world's most powerful telepath. As he regains consciousness, he spots none other than William Stryker sitting in front of him, with Yuriko Oyama, aka Lady Deathstrike, looming against the wall like the world's most intimidating wallpaper. That strange helmet? It's blocking Xavier from entering Stryker's mind. No psychic peeking today. Xavier asks where Scott is. Stryker, playing the role of smug villain, tells him not to worry. Scott's just getting a bit of re-education. Xavier quickly pieces together what's going on and realizes that this all ties back to Stryker's son. 
he reminds Stryker that he came to him wanting a cure for his son, but mutation isn't a disease. Of course, that's not what Stryker wants to hear. Eyes blazing with anger, Stryker accuses Xavier of lying. He reveals that when Jason returned from Xavier's school, he resented his parents, blaming them for his condition. Jason, a powerful telepath like his former teacher, started toying with their minds, projecting visions and nightmares until Mrs. Stryker, driven mad, took her own life. Dark stuff. Xavier, keeping his cool, glances at Lady Deathstrike and points out the irony. Stryker sure spends a lot of time with mutants for a guy who claims to hate them. Stryker, not missing a beat, shows off the device he uses to control Yuriko, stuck right on her back. Seems Stryker's got more control issues than just over his son. Xavier suddenly realizes Stryker was the one behind the attack on the president. Stryker, clearly pleased with himself, congratulates Xavier on figuring it out, without even needing to read his mind. Yuriko leaves the room, and Stryker starts laying out his grand plan. He complains that no one knows how many mutants are out there, or how to find them. Except Xavier, of course. Unfortunately, Xavier is too powerful for simple mind control, so Stryker's decided to go straight to the source. And by source, he means introducing Xavier to Mutant 143, a young, sickly-looking mute man in a wheelchair, his head connected to a series of mind-controlling pipes. As the figure rolls into view, Xavier's heart sinks. He recognizes the young man immediately, Jason Stryker, William's son. Xavier, horrified, demands to know how Stryker could do this to his own child. With chilling indifference, Stryker replies, No, Charles, my son is dead, just like the rest of you will be. And with that, he leaves Xavier alone with his twisted creation. Suddenly, in a strange turn of events, Xavier finds himself standing in his study at the Institute. Wait a minute, standing? He quickly realizes it's just an illusion and shouts, Jason, stop it! But Jason, under Stryker's mind control, does not respond. The illusion continues. Now Xavier's back in his wheelchair, still in his study, when he hears the sound of a little girl crying. He calls out to her, telling her it's safe to come out, and asks her where all the other students are. She doesn't know, but Xavier reassures her. They'll find the others using Cerebro. In this illusion, Xavier and the little girl move through the mansion's underground tunnels, heading towards Cerebro. After the eye scan, the doors open, and the girl, clearly frightened, asks him not to leave her alone. Xavier tells her she can come inside with him. They enter together, but in the real world, that little girl, well, she's not real. It's Jason, manipulating Xavier's mind while a soldier watches over the entire scene, unaware of the battle going on in the professor's head. The scene heats up as all the soldiers are set to defend Cerebro like it's the last stand of mutant kind. Stryker steps in, looking as smug as ever, entering the code to gain access. Inside, he spots his son, Jason, controlling Xavier's mind. Leaning down, Stryker whispers in Jason's ear, telling him it's time to go find their friends. All of them. All the mutants everywhere. In Xavier's illusion, the little girl, aka Jason's projection, echoes Stryker's words, asking if it's time to find all their mutant friends. Xavier, unknowingly caught in the trap, agrees. Stryker, proud of his twisted handiwork, tells Jason to make him proud and exit Cerebro. In the illusion, Xavier is now wearing the Cerebro helmet, preparing to search for every mutant on the planet. The girl tells him not to move, and outside, Stryker, ever the paranoid villain, orders the soldiers to shoot anyone who comes near, even if it's him. Xavier starts looking at the red lights, each representing a mutant, unaware he's about to unleash something terrible. Back in the illusion, the girl asks Xavier if he's found all the mutants yet. He replies that he's trying, but there are just so many of them. The girl tells him to focus, pushing Xavier closer to hurting every mutant out there. In the real world, soldiers suddenly hear footsteps approaching and immediately aim their guns, ready for trouble. But who strolls up? None other than Magneto and Mystique, cool as ever, making their way to Cerebro like it's just another day at the office. Magneto, always one step ahead, puts his helmet on to block Jason's illusions. Inside, Xavier is still concentrating on the mutant population, unaware of the chaos about to unfold. But Magneto, being the master of metal manipulation, succeeds in opening the doors, shutting down Cerebro in the process. Inside the illusion, Xavier is confused. Something's wrong. The little girl, now panicking, looks to him for answers. Magneto mocks Xavier's methods. We're not playing by your rules anymore, Charles, he says with a sly grin. Maybe it's time to play by ours. With a wave of his hand, Magneto starts moving the metal plates around Cerebro, revealing the room's inner workings. Mystique, watching him in awe, because let's be honest, the guy's got style, waits for his signal. Magneto lands, nods to her, and Mystique shifts into Stryker. Stepping inside, she mimics Stryker's voice perfectly and whispers into Jason's ear, telling him there's been a change of plants. Magneto, pleased with his manipulation, smiles and bids Xavier farewell as he and Mystique walk out, closing the doors behind them with an ominous finality. In Xavier's illusion, the little girl once again speaks up, 
There's been a change of plans, Professor, she says, her tone now more sinister. We're targeting the humans, all of them. Suddenly, white lights representing humans appear in Cerebro. The effect of this new target reaches the real world. Stryker, who's been so smug up until now, grabs his head in pain as Cerebro begins attacking the humans, his people. And it's not just him. Across the world, every white light in Cerebro feels the pain, including none other than President McKenna. The tables have turned, and the chaos Magneto set in motion is just beginning. Outside Cerebro 2, Nightcrawler's feeling a bit sentimental. He hugs Storm and starts praying, which, considering what they're about to face, isn't the worst idea. Then, in a poof of purple smoke, they teleport inside Cerebro. But something's off. Xavier's nowhere in sight. Instead, standing where the machine should be is a little girl. Or so it seems. She greets them with a eerie hello and asks who they're looking for. Storm, having zero patience for illusions, isn't falling for it. She calls out to the professor, telling him he's got to stop Cerebro. Now. The girl, still playing her creepy little game, asks who they're talking to, and Nightcrawler, the ever-innocent, starts walking toward her like she's just a lost child in need of a hug. Storm pulls a classic hold up and stops him. Don't move, she warns. Nightcrawler, still seeing nothing but a harmless kid, says, but she's just a little girl. Storm, all business, replies, she's not. Cue dramatic tension. Storm gives Nightcrawler the heads up that things are about to get very chilly in there. His response? I'm not going anywhere. Famous last words, because Storm's eyes begin to glow and her hair starts doing that windswept superhero thing. The girl, aka Jason, asks what she's doing, but Storm's already gone full-on goddess of weather. Her eyes glow white, and before you know it, a fierce wind is howling through Cerebro, and the temperature drops like a bad stock market crash. Nightcrawler, who by this point is regretting his I'm not going anywhere line, drops to his knees as the cold hits him like a ton of icy bricks. Inside Xavier's illusion, the girl keeps telling him to focus, find all the humans. But outside, in reality, Jason is freezing. The cold is breaking his concentration. The little girl screams at Storm to stop it, but it's too late. The freezing temperature is too much for Jason to handle, and just like that, Xavier snaps out of the illusion. He yanks off the Cerebro helmet, finally free. As he comes back to reality, he sees Jason, Storm, and Kurt. But in the real world, the ceiling of Cerebro starts collapsing around them. Thinking fast, Kurt teleports Aurora and Xavier out of there just in the nick of time. Unfortunately, Jason is beyond saving. With no time to mourn, all the mutants rush through the halls toward the spillway, thinking it's their only shot at escape. They make it to the doors, but before they can get caught in the flood, Logan shows up. Classic timing, popping out of a tunnel. He smashes into a fuse box, closing the door right before the water bursts through. You don't want to go that way, Logan says. And as if on cue, water explodes through the cracks to confirm his point. Logan leads the crew through another way out, proving once again why he's the best at what he does. Outside, things go from bad to worse. The water that had been leaking through the dam suddenly stops. It's been redirected. The mutants rush out into the snow, but just as they think they've made it, Artie falls. In full Wolverine mode, Logan picks him up and carries him, but when they look around in shock and horror, they realize their ride is already gone. Magneto has taken off with their helicopter. Just when all hope seems to be lost, Rogue shows up in the jet, though it's spinning uncontrollably in the air. Turns out flying isn't as easy as it looks. With all the courage of a first-time pilot, Rogue manages to make an emergency landing, crashing into the snow. Everyone's alive, but they definitely won't be winning any awards for smooth landings. Kurt teleports Xavier inside the jet, and the team braces themselves for whatever comes next. In the jet, things are tense. Xavier turns to Scott and tells him they need to get to Washington, fast. Whatever's happening now is beyond even their usual superhero league. Scott and Aurora exchange panicked looks as they realize something's wrong. The jet won't take off. Rogue, noticing the vibe shift, asks if anyone's seen John, aka Pyro. Jean, after a quick telepathic scan, drops the bomb. John's with Magneto now. Cue the collective disappointment. To make matters worse, the jet suddenly loses power right as the dam bursts again, unable to handle the pressure. Things are about to go from bad to worse. Jean, sitting in the back, realizes it's all on her now. She's their last hope. She looks around at her friends, her family, and makes a decision. Without anyone noticing, she quietly leaves the jet. But it doesn't take long before Xavier realizes she's gone. He calls out her name, alarming both Scott and Logan. She's outside, Xavier says, and Scott, already panicking, rushes to the exit. But Jean, in true telekinetic fashion, slams the door shut, keeping him inside. She activates the jet from the outside, and Scott yells at Aurora not to take off, but it's too late. Jean's doing it for her. Meanwhile, outside, Stryker falls with the dam, and a massive wave of water surges toward the jet. Jean, showing off just how powerful she really is, uses one hand to keep the water 
water at bay, and the other to free the jet from the snow. Scott watches helplessly, his heart breaking. Logan orders Kurt to teleport out and get her, but Kurt, looking devastated, says she's not letting him. And then, Jean's final goodbye comes in the most heartbreaking way possible. She uses her telepathy to speak through Xavier's mouth, telling them all that she knows what she's doing. This is the only way. Scott, utterly wrecked, begs her not to do it, but Jean, ever the hero, says goodbye. Her body begins to glow orange, her eyes bright with the power of the phoenix. She lifts the jet into the air, breaking it free from the snow. With one final push, she releases her telekinetic hold, allowing the water to crash over her. Jean Grey, their friend, their hero, is gone, and the entire team is left grieving in the aftermath. Scott falls apart, crying on Logan's shoulder, and even the tough-as-nails Wolverine is overwhelmed by the tragedy. The entire jet is filled with sorrow, their throats tight with grief as they fly above what is now a vast sea. Kurt, ever faithful, prays for Jean, for the loss they all feel so deeply. In Washington, the scene shifts to a very different kind of tension. President McKenna is making his way to a live television broadcast from his office. He starts his speech with all the gravita of a world leader. My fellow Americans, in this time of adversity, we're being offered a moment, a moment to recognize a growing threat within our own population and take a unique role in shaping the course of human events. He's really getting into it, but before he can continue, all the cameras and lights in the room shut off. The room plunges into darkness and the staff freeze in place, not even able to blink. Suddenly, the sky outside turns ominously dark and lightning strikes, illuminating the room in quick, jagged flashes. The president, startled, looks up to see mutants standing before him, led by none other than Storm, her eyes glowing white with power. The only light in the room comes from the lightning, casting dramatic shadows over their faces. The president's fear hits a peak when he recognizes one of his attackers, Nightcrawler, the same mutant who'd been involved in the White House incident. It's clear the president wasn't expecting this kind of meeting. Professor Xavier greets the president with a calm good morning. With his usual reassuring tone, he tells the president that no one's here to harm him. The president, still on edge from this unexpected visit, asks, who are you? Xavier replies, we're mutants, and my name is Charles Xavier. Rogue, playing her part, steps forward and places some documents on the president's desk. These aren't just any papers. Xavier explains that they were taken from William Stryker's private office. The president, still trying to keep his composure, asks how they managed to get their hands on them. Xavier, always with a twinkle of humor, simply says, I know a little girl who can walk through walls. The president, glancing at the documents, admits he's never seen this information before. Xavier says, I know. The president tries to assert himself, saying that he doesn't respond well to threats, but Xavier corrects him. This is not a threat. This is an opportunity. Xavier lays it out. There are forces in this world, both human and mutant, who believe a war is brewing. As the president can see from the files, some have already tried to light that fuse, and there have been casualties on both sides. But this moment, Xavier says, is crucial. The president is about to address the world, and what he says will shape the future. It's a moment. A moment to either repeat the mistakes of the past or work together for a better tomorrow. The mutants aren't going anywhere. They're here to stay. The next move, it's his. And with that, Xavier gives one final warning. We'll be watching. As the words hang in the air, a flash of lightning illuminates their faces one last time before they disappear, leaving the president standing there, stunned as the lights flick back on. Silent, he's unsure of what to say to the waiting cameras. Back at Xavier's study, the mood is much more somber. Scott stands by the window, lost in thought. Xavier reflects on Jean, noting that even as a student, she was always hesitant about her powers. She looked to others, afraid that she might be left behind in some way. Scott, his voice thick with emotion, asks if they could have done more to Xavier. Xavier, with the wisdom of a man who's seen too much loss, says that in the past, Jean might have let them save her, but not this time. Logan can't understand why Jean left the plane at all. Xavier, resigned, answers simply, she made a choice. The scene shifts as students start entering the classroom, the familiar faces of Artie, Colossus, Jones, Bobby, Danielle Moonstar, and Jubilee among them. Logan and Scott leave the study together, but before they part ways, Logan turns to Scott. Jean made a choice, he says, offering some words of comfort, and that choice was you. But Scott, still grieving, walks away, the weight of those words offering little comfort now. Xavier stays behind, alone with his thoughts. One of the students asks him if everything's alright. The professor, always optimistic, answers with quiet reassurance. Yes, it will be. X-Men, The Last Stand Professor Xavier, always the calm voice of reason, approaches Wolverine with a request. I need you to fill in for Scott during the Danger Room session, he says. 
Scott is still deep in despair over losing Jean Grey, and the professor knows Logan is the only one who can handle it. Wolverine, probably not thrilled at the idea of babysitting a bunch of mutant teens in a high-tech training room, grunts but agrees, because when the professor asks, you don't say no. Meanwhile, Professor X is in his element, teaching his ethics class with all the grace and wisdom of a seasoned Jedi Master. Today's topic, the use and misuse of power. He explains to his young students that power, especially mutant power, can be used for the greater good or can spiral into something destructive and selfish. This is a dilemma every mutant must face. Why? Because they're not just regular people, they're mutants. And for psychics, he adds, the challenge is even trickier. When is it okay to use their powers, and when do they cross that invisible line that turns them from protectors into tyrants over their fellow men? Heavy stuff. Then, Shadowcat, because there's always that one student who loves to quote famous people, chimes in with a quote from Einstein. Ethics are an exclusive human concern without any superhuman authority behind it. Xavier, without missing a beat, smiles and quips, well, Einstein wasn't a mutant, as far as we know. The class giggles, the mood lightened for a moment, and then Xavier switches gears, bringing out a tape sent to him by Dr. Moira McTaggart. On the tape, Dr. McTaggart is standing beside a man lying in a hospital bed. She explains that the man was born with no higher level brain functions. His body works, his organs and nerves are fine, but there's no consciousness. He is an empty shell. Xavier turns off the video and with that professorly wisdom asks his students a loaded ethical question. What if they could transfer the consciousness of someone, say a father of four with terminal cancer, into the body of this man? Where does the ethical behavior begin and where does it cross the line? The students are on the edge of their seat but before Xavier can finish the lesson, he stops mid-sentence. Something is wrong. Outside the window, massive rain clouds are gathering, blocking out the sun. The mood shifts. For a moment, there's silence. Xavier, ever in tune with the world, quietly dismisses the class, telling them they'll continue tomorrow. Out on the balcony, Storm is standing in the wind, staring at the ominous clouds she unintentionally summoned. The professor wheels up from behind her and, with that dry wit, reminds her that the forecast was for sunny skies. Storm, looking a little sheepish, apologizes as her eyes start to glow. In just a few moments, the clouds scatter and the sun returns, bathing the scene in light. Xavier moves closer to her and, without needing his telepathy, says, I don't need to be psychic to know something's bothering you. As they walk inside, Aurora, never one to hold back, turns to Xavier with a question that's been bothering her. I don't understand, she says, her voice full of frustration. Magneto's a fugitive. We've got a mutant in the cabinet and a president who gets us. Why are we still hiding? Xavier answers that they're not exactly hiding, but they do still have enemies out there. He must protect his students. Aurora, nodding but not fully satisfied, agrees, though she makes a valid point. But they can't be students forever. Xavier chuckles and says, Aurora, I haven't thought of you as my student in years. In fact, he adds, I thought you might just take my place someday. That catches Aurora off guard. She stops walking, surprised. I thought Scott would be the one to take your place, she says, still adjusting to the idea. Xavier, his tone more serious, explains that Scott is a changed man. Losing Jean hit him harder than anyone could have imagined. Things are better out there, Xavier says, but you, of all people, should know how quickly the weather can change. Storm, realizing there's more going on than Xavier's letting on, gives him a look, but he just sighs and wheels onward, keeping whatever it is to himself. As they enter another room, they find none other than Hank McCoy, Beast, examining a painting on the wall, probably lost in thought about its brushstrokes. Aurora's face lights up, thrilled to see her old friend. They share a hug and exchange compliments about what they've done with their hair since they last saw each other, because even in a world of mutants, stop matters. Hank thanks Xavier for seeing him on such short notice, and Xavier, always warm, tells him that he's always welcome. He's part of this place. Beast nods and says he has news. Xavier, ever cautious, asks, is it Eric? But Hank shakes his head. No, although we've made some progress there. Mystique was recently apprehended. Just then, Logan, who never seems to miss an entrance, strolls in and immediately gets cheeky. Who's the furball, he asks with a smirk. Hank, taking it in stride, introduces himself as the Secretary of Mutant Affairs. Logan shoots back, nice suit, classic Wolverine. Xavier introduces Logan to Hank, but Beast is already ahead of him. He's heard of Wolverine. Storm cuts in. Magneto will definitely come to get Mystique. But Beast, his expression serious, shakes his head. Magneto's not the problem, or at least not the most pressing one. The room falls quiet. Beast drops a bombshell. A major pharmaceutical company has developed a mutant antibody, a way to suppress the mutant X gene permanently. They're calling it a cure, Hank says. For a moment, everyone is stunned, the weight of the news sinking in. Storm, breaking the silence, is the first to react. 
Her voice filled with indignation, she says, that's ridiculous, you can't cure being a mutant, since when have we become a disease? Xavier, sensing the gravity of the situation, quiets her, his eyes focused, knowing that they're likely announcing it now. Whatever hope they had for peace just got a lot more complicated. At Worthington Labs, and none other than Alcatraz, Warren Worthington Jr. is delivering a speech at a press conference, looking every bit the corporate mogul. He talks about mutants, but not in the way you'd hope. He calls them people, just like the rest of us, but with a catch. Their mutation, he says, is nothing more than a disease, a corruption of healthy cells. Ouch. He stands there, self-righteous, and announces to the world that there's hope for these so-called mutants. Alcatraz, which used to be the world's most notorious prison, will now be a source of freedom for mutants, at least for those who choose to take the cure. Not exactly the hero's speech we were all hoping for. Meanwhile, back at the mansion, things are spiraling out of control. Professor Xavier suddenly senses Cyclops' distress. Something is not right. Scott's name echoes telepathically through the halls of the school and you can feel the panic rising. Wolverine and Storm, their instincts kicking in, tear through the halls, racing towards Xavier's office. They're not sure what's happening, but it's clear that it's bad. They burst into the professor's office, breathless, asking if he's okay. Xavier, calm but serious, tells them the situation. They need to get to Alkali Lake fast. Later, in the school's infirmary, the scene is tense. Logan and Professor X stand beside Jean Grey's unconscious body, the air heavy with the weight of what's happened. Xavier, in full professor mode, explains that Jean should have been obliterated by the sheer mass of water that collapsed on top of her, but somehow she survived. The only explanation? Her powers created a telekinetic cocoon around her, protecting her from certain death. Wolverine, ever the practical one, asks the big question, will she be okay? Xavier, knowing just just how complicated things are, explains that Jean Grey isn't just any mutant. She's the only class 5 mutant he's ever encountered. Her potential is practically limitless, but that kind of power comes with a price. Her mutation is rooted deep in her unconscious mind, making it incredibly dangerous. When she was a child, Xavier built psychic barriers in her mind to keep her powers in check, isolating them from her conscious mind. But as a result, Jean developed a dual personality. There's the Jean they all know and love, the one who keeps her powers under control. And then there's the other side the dormant personality, one that calls itself the Phoenix, a purely instinctual creature driven by power and desire. Logan, processing this revelation, realizes they're dealing with something far more dangerous than they ever imagined. The Phoenix isn't just a name, it's a force that's been waiting to emerge, and now that it's here, the stakes have never been higher. Taking all of this in, Wolverine asks Xavier, did Jean know all of this? The professor, with the weight of the world in his voice, replies that it's unclear how much Jean knew, but the bigger issue is whether the woman lying in front of them is the Jean Grey they know, or the Phoenix, furiously struggling to break free. Logan glances at Jean and says, she looks pretty peaceful to me. Xavier, shaking his head, says that's because he's keeping her that way, trying to restore the psychic blocks and cage the beast once more. Logan growls that this is too much. What have you done to her, he snaps. After all, they're talking about someone's mind here, not a dangerous animal. Xavier, trying to keep things calm, tells Logan to understand. Jean has to be controlled. But Logan, in classic Wolverine fashion, shoots back, sometimes when you cage the beast, the beast gets angry. Xavier, holding his ground, warns Logan that he has no idea of what Jean is truly capable of. But Logan doesn't back down. Xavier, showing the burden of his decisions, explains that he had a terrible choice to make, and he chose what he thought was the lesser of two evils. But Logan, still fuming, says it sounds like Jean didn't have any choice at all. The tension in the room is thick as Xavier, clearly frustrated, finally says, I don't have to explain myself least of all to you. With that, he continues working on Jean's mind. Logan, still angry and feeling betrayed, storms out of the room. Later, Storm and Professor X rush into the room, only to find Wolverine unconscious on the floor. Aurora quickly wakes Logan, asking what happened. Logan, groggy but panicked, asks where Jean is. Xavier, already fearing the worst, demands to know what Logan has done. I think Jean killed Scott, Logan says, words weighing heavily upon him. But Storm, refusing to believe it, insists that's impossible. Xavier, now furious and desperate, tells Logan he warned him about this. He tries to telepathically scan for Jean, but finds her trying to block him, something she was never able to do before. She's so strong, he mutters, the realization hitting him hard. It may be too late. Not long after, outside the Grey residence, the car pulls up. Out step the three X-Men, Xavier, Wolverine, and Storm. The tension is thick as Xavier turns to Logan and Aurora, telling them to wait outside. I need to see Jean alone, he says, the weight of the situation clear in his voice. But before he can enter, Magneto appears in front of them, making his entrance as dramatically as ever. You were right, Charles, he says with a hint of admiration. This one is special. Wolverine immediately demands to know what he's doing there. 
Magneto replies, same as the professor, visiting an old friend. Xavier, not in the mood for games, tells Eric that he doesn't want any trouble. Magneto, surprisingly agreeable, replies, neither do I. There's a brief moment of tension before Magneto extends an offer. Shall we? He gestures toward the house, and with that, Xavier and Magneto, the two old rivals, head inside together. As Xavier and Magneto make their way through the Grey House, Xavier turns to Eric with a serious tone. Please, Eric, don't interfere. I came to bring Jean home. Magneto, never one to miss an opportunity for a quip, chuckles. Just like old times, he says, but Xavier cuts through the joke, stating plainly, she's not well, she needs help. Magneto, unfazed, replies with a jab. You sound just like her parents did all those years ago. On the front lawn, Magneto's followers stand ready, a silent but menacing backdrop to the tension building inside. On their way in, Magneto gives Juggernaut a command. Don't let anyone else inside. With that, the doors creak open and the two old friends turned foes step into the house. As they walk through, the house seems to come alive. Furniture floats eerily in the air, hinting at the power swirling around them. They finally reach the living room, where Jean stands, waiting. She locks eyes with Xavier and says coldly, I knew you'd come. Xavier, ever the mentor, replies, I came to bring you home. But Jean, her voice ice cold, tells him she has no home. Xavier insists she does indeed. She has a home and a family. Magneto takes a step forward, his voice soft but dangerous. He implies that Xavier thinks her power is too great for her to control. Xavier, alarmed, warns Eric to stay out of this, but Magneto doesn't back down. Jean, caught between the two, turns to Xavier and asks a question. Do you want to control me? Xavier, desperate to reach her, says no, but Magneto jumps in, twisting the moment. Yes, he does, Eric says, fanning the flames. Xavier, still trying to calm her, insists, I want to help you. But Jean, confused and angry, asks, what's wrong with me? Magneto, ever manipulative, leans in. There's nothing wrong with you, he says. But before he can keep pushing, Xavier, fed up, yells, stop this, Eric. Magneto claims that Xavier's always held her back, but Xavier, knowing the states, explains that it was for her own good. Jean has enough, though. With a flick of her hand, a lamp is smashed telekinetically against the wall. Stay out of my head, she demands, her powers flaring with anger. Suddenly, all the doors and windows of the house slam shut with a deafening thud as her mind begins to rage. Xavier, still composed despite the chaos, pleads with her. Jean, look at me. I can help you. But Jean, now furious, repeats her demand. Get out of my head. Her powers push Xavier's wheelchair back as Magneto, standing to the side, smugly suggests that he should listen to her. Xavier refuses to give up. He asks for her to trust him, and he says that she's a danger to everyone and herself. Magneto, instigating, says, you sound just like the humans wanting to give her the cure. Xavier, undeterred, keeps his focus on Jean. He brings up Scott, telling her, look at what happened to Scott. You killed the man you love because you can't control your powers. Hearing this, something inside her snaps. Her powers explode in a massive telekinetic blast, shattering windows and sending Magneto flying into the kitchen. In the center of it all, Jean, the phoenix, is unleashing her full power. The entire living room becomes a swirling storm of telekinetic fury. Furniture, debris, and everything in between flies around in a chaotic whirlwind. Xavier, locked in a mental struggle with Jean, pleads one more time. Let me into your mind. But Jean's not listening anymore. She's too far gone. Xavier is suddenly lifted from his wheelchair, floating upright in the air, his face calm despite the immense strain on his body. Magneto, watching in awe from the kitchen, realizes that things are spiraling out of control. Not only is Xavier floating, but the entire house begins to lift off the ground, suspended by Jean's power. Even Logan, somewhere in the chaos, is hurled upward, slamming into the ceiling. Xavier's body tenses, every muscle straining under the weight of Jean's mental assault, but his expression remains unchanged focused, determined. Magneto, now realizing this is going much further than he ever intended, yells from the kitchen, Jean, stop, please don't do this. But Jean, the phoenix, won't listen. Her power, raw and uncontainable, surges throughout the house, as if she's lost to it completely. Wolverine starts using his claws to get around. Sticking them into the ceiling as if he's scaling a mountain, he struggles against Jean's telekinetic force, which is keeping him glued to the ceiling. Every pull is a battle, but he's not giving up. He claws his way toward the living room, pushing through the storm of debris flying around like a telekinetic tornado. Finally, he reaches the door and pulls it open, arriving just in time to witness something he could have never prepared for. In the living room, Xavier's entire body starts to move, really move. His skin ripples like it's caught in a wild windstorm, waves of energy rolling across him as Jean's powers surge uncontrollably. Logan and Magneto, standing on opposite sides of the room, can only watch in helpless disbelief. 
Jean Grey, their Jean is using her power on the very man who was once her mentor. In the middle of the chaos, something extraordinary happens. For just a moment, a profound silence cuts through the noise, the flying objects, and the devastation. Time seems to slow down, and only Jean and Xavier exist in this quiet space. In those few seconds, Xavier, knowing these are likely his last moments, smiles gently at Jean. He speaks softly, his voice calm, almost peaceful. Don't let it control you. And then, before anyone can react, the unthinkable happens. In front of Wolverine and Magneto's astonished, horrified eyes, Professor Charles Xavier, the heart and soul of the X-Men, vanishes. His body, consumed by the Phoenix's power, blows apart and disappears into thin air, leaving nothing behind but the empty space where he once stood. Logan and Aurora rush into the living room, what's left of it, but all that's left is Xavier's empty wheelchair. They stand there, breaths heavy, eyes wide, trying to make sense of the impossible. Logan drops to his knees, the weight of the loss crashing down on him like a tidal wave. No, he yells, his voice raw with pain and helplessness. Aurora, overwhelmed by the grief, falls onto Logan's back, hugging him tightly as sobs rack her body. The two of them, two of the most powerful X-Men, are left utterly broken, kneeling in the ruins of the home, mourning their fallen leader. The next day, Xavier's mansion feels emptier than it ever has. In his study, the wheelchair sits alone, as if waiting for its owner to return. But it's clear now he's never returning. Outside on the front lawn, the entire school is gathered. Aurora stands in front of them, eulogizing the man who shaped all of their lives. We live in an age of darkness, she says, her voice heavy with emotion. A world full of fear, hate, and intolerance. But in every age, there are those who fight against it. She pauses, eyes glistening with tears. Charles Xavier was born into a world divided, a world he tried to heal, a mission he never saw accomplished. It seems the destiny of great men to see their goals unfulfilled. Filled. Her words hang in the air, a tribute to the man who gave everything to protect and guide them. The student, staff, and friends stand in silence, their hearts heavy with loss, but their spirits lifted by the legacy Xavier left behind. His dream of peace, of unity, now rests in their hands. In the crowd, we see familiar faces. Rogue, Bobby Drake, Kitty Pride, Peter Rasputin, Hank McCoy, and many other students who loved and admired Xavier. They sit together, united in their grief, but Logan, the lone wolf, stands apart, listening on from a distance. Rogue catches sight of him, watching quietly, while Aurora's voice carries on, full of emotion. Charles was more than a leader, Aurora says, her words heavy with the weight of loss. More than a teacher, he was a friend. When we were afraid, he gave us strength. When we were alone, he gave us a family. As she speaks, Kitty's eyes fill with tears, the sadness overwhelming her. Sitting next to her, Bobby gently places his hand over hers, offering silent comfort. Aurora's voice grows even more determined as she concludes the eulogy. He may be gone, but his teachings live on through us, his students. Wherever we may go, we must carry on his vision a vision of a world united. Logan starts to walk away as Aurora finishes, retreating into his own world. Behind him, the rest of the crowd stands up at one, honoring Xavier's memory. One by one, they walk to his memorial and place flowers, a gesture of love and respect for the man who gave them so much. But the story doesn't end there. After the battle at Alcatraz, Moira McTaggart returns to Moyer Island to check on her comatose patient, the very same man from the video Xavier showed his students lying in a hospital bed silent and still. Moira, as always, enters the room with a soft good morning before glancing at the monitors to check the patient's vital signs. It's all routine. But then, something extraordinary happens. The man, silent for so long, slowly turns his head toward her. Moira freezes, eyes wide with shock. And then, in a voice that sends a shiver down her spine, he speaks, Good morning, Moira. It's Charles's voice. Moira stares in disbelief. It can't be, but there's no mistaking it. She looks toward the man, her mind racing, and whispers, Charles? The patient looks back at her, and in that moment, Moira realizes the impossible. Charles Xavier's consciousness has survived his physical death. Somehow, some way, the professor lives on. The Wolverine. Years after the battle at Alcatraz, a miracle, or rather mutant miracle, unfolds. Professor Xavier returns, but in a new form, the body of his twin brother. Unfortunately, after decades in a coma, his brother's body has developed muscle atrophy, and so, even in this new body, he still needs his iconic wheelchair to move around. Alongside Magneto, Xavier seeks out Logan for help against dark forces that are once again threatening to destroy mutant kind. Logan, skeptical, can't help but ask the obvious. How are you even alive, Charles? Xavier, with that trademark calm and mystery, just smiles and replies, you're not the only one with gifts. X-Men, Days of Future Past 
With that, the stage is set. Xavier, Magneto, Wolverine, and Storm head to China to meet with mutants in hiding, preparing a plan that could change everything. The mission? Send Professor X back to 1973 to stop Mystique from killing Bolivar Trask, a murder that set off the chain reaction leading to the creation of the Deadly Sentinel program. But they quickly learn that while Shadowcat has the ability to project someone's mind into the past, the process is incredibly dangerous. She's never sent anyone back more than a month before, and even Xavier, with all his power, wouldn't survive a trip that far. Realizing the answer, Wolverine steps forward. With his healing factor, he can survive the strain of being sent back to 1973. Logan volunteers to take Xavier's place, understanding that the mission rests on his shoulders. As the X-Men hide in a monastery, preparing for the mission, Shadowcat gets ready to send Wolverine back in time. But before the leap into the past, both Xavier and Magneto ask Wolverine for one more favor. In 1973, Xavier wasn't the man we know today. He was uncertain, broken, unsure of his path. This time, Wolverine has to be the mentor, to guide the younger Professor X the way Xavier once guided him. It's a tall order, but Logan agrees. When Wolverine arrives in the past, the younger Professor X, far from the calm leader we know, tells him outright, I'm the wrong man for this job. But Logan, gruff as always, explains that he's the only one who can do it. The key moment comes when Wolverine convinces a young Xavier to enter his mind and connect with his future self. And in an incredible moment, the present and future collide. Future Professor X reaches out to his past self. He reminds him not to give up on peace between mutants and humans, inspiring him to regain his hope and embrace his powers. With renewed purpose, young Xavier agrees to use Cerebro to locate Mystique, knowing that everything depends on what happens next. But while the past is being rewritten, the present, now the future, faces a deadly threat. At the monastery, the battle is fierce. Storm, Bishop, Colossus, Warpath, Sunspot, Iceman, and Blink fight bravely, but one by one they fall. The Sentinels are relentless, and their deadly mission seems inevitable. As they breach the monastery, they set their sights on the last of the X-Men, Shadowcat, Wolverine, Magneto, and Professor X. The Sentinels fire, and everything seems lost. Shadowcat, struggling to keep her grip on Wolverine's mind, finally lets go. And like that, the future changes in an instant. The world, their fate, is rewritten. Logan. In the year 2029, Charles Xavier, the once mighty leader of the X-Men, is now a shadow of his former self. A frail, senile old man battling a degenerative brain condition that's far more dangerous than it sounds. The man who once controlled the most powerful mind on the planet now suffers from uncontrollable psychic seizures, and these seizures are no small matter. A year before the events of the story, one such seizure tragically claimed the lives of several X-Men. Now, Charles lives in an abandoned smelting plant just across the Mexican border, where Logan and Caliban and search for him in his fading years. It's a far cry from the grand halls of the Xavier Institute. Even with his declining mind and physical health, Charles Xavier's powers are still formidable. His mind may be slipping, but make no mistake, when his telepathy flares, it's still a force to be reckoned with. Take the incident at the hotel, for instant. A particularly violent seizure sends out a psychic blast so powerful it freezes everyone around him in place. No one can move. No one except Logan, who has to step in to stop it. It's a terrifying reminder that while Xavier's body may be fragile, his psychic power still burns bright, sometimes too bright. Yet, in the middle of all this chaos, there are still moments of clarity, like when Charles, traveling with Logan and Laura, uses his telepathy to calm a group of runaway horses, guiding them safely back to their owners. Even in his old age, there's a glimpse of the man he once was, a reminder of the greatness that still lingers. But then comes the tragedy no one saw coming. Xavier, one of the last remaining X-Men, meets his end at the hands of X-24, a genetically engineered clone of Logan. In a cruel twist of fate, while staying with a kind family who had offered them shelter, X-24 brutally murders Charles in cold blood. It's a moment that marks the end of an era. Xavier's death doesn't just signal the loss of a mentor or a friend, it signifies the closing chapter of the X-Men's legacy. Logan, left with the crushing weight of guilt and grief, now faces the harsh reality of a world without Charles Xavier. And as he continues on his journey with Laura, Logan carries the knowledge that the X-Men, his family, are truly gone. In this unforgiving world, it's just him and Laura now, alone and struggling to survive in a world that feels so much darker without the light of Professor Xavier. And that's it for today, the complete timeline of Charles Francis Xavier from Fox's Marvel X-Men movies. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell to stay updated for future videos. Excelsior!